I'm going to hang up this phone. And then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. That, that furry I'm porn was for research only. Without, wait, wait, what? Wait, what? <coughs> Nothing. Continue. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I'd leave to you. If you'd like to make a call, please hang up and try again. You already did that, that joke, jerk. jerk. Hola. That wasn't even the right song. You're not even the right song! Alright, calm down there, jump scare underneath. And by the way, what's with these beards? It's been a minute since the last review. I like it. Somebody said I look like old Kratos. Are you sure they didn't say old Play-Doh? <laughs> it's time! Get your best viruses ready! Uh, my what? And pop open a Joel Cola! This is the box office bomb turned cult hit, The Net. Wait. This is Hackers. Seattle, 1988. A mother pig gives birth to a litter of human rights violations, and I'm surprised nobody has been taken into custody yet, especially with this cis white male waving a very obvious gun around like that. It's probably because the frame rate is making everybody motion sick, like there's too many enemy sprites on screen. What is this, the Spider-Verse? Wait, this is Seattle 1988, shouldn't it be more like this? I guess not. Hey, what's the tape deck doing? That was a rare recording of fecal matter. Yeah, well it is now. Deep in the concrete jungle of suburbia, we come across a rare glimpse of the elusive housewife stalking her prey. The Gestapo death squad here kicks the door down and goose steps their way in, heading up to the room at the top of the stairs. Knock it down. Weirdest DoorDash experience ever. All that low frame rate shaky cam bullshit later, and we finally get to see what caused the commotion in Pleasantville, leading us to a courtroom with sassy lawyer Halloween costume. Apparently Calvin here, known as Dade Murphy, played by Max Lagoche, murdered and ate three people over the summer of 84. What? Okay, he just famed the ID Zero Cool by developing a virus that crashed 1,507 pewters and made a big dent in the stock market, all at the age of... whatever this is, Fortnite. XDDDDDDD Dade Murphy? I hereby fine your family $45,000. Wow! And sentence you to probation, under which you are forbidden to own or operate a computer or touch-tone telephone until the day of your 18th birthday. And no, I didn't edit out the trial to save time. Yeah, right. You edit out footage. Fuck you, dog. No, fuck you. They literally went from opening statement to verdict within a single cut. Now that's justice. I hope you're watching, State Farm. So they sentenced Day to do a cliche courthouse step scene, while a slowed down version of the Reading Rainbow theme song is played over someone getting clitoral ladder piercings. Piss off, I like Orbital. Oh yeah, me too. Seven years later, Dade, now played by Johnny Lee Miller, is allowed to return from being so grounded he needed to take a plane back from whatever timeout corner he was sent to, and it turned him into Yolandi Visser from Die Antwood? We get a flyover of the big crapple when suddenly all the buildings begin morphing into- You gotta be fucking kidding me! And this is 1995 too? We're still getting typecasted. 
It goes from main street to main frame when the director decides to tweak their computer chip kink and land a fat load of font on the audience's face that can only be labeled as Bukaki Bold. <laughs> Barely legal now, Dade decides to secretly hook up his computer to the internet and start fishing for ID10T, looking to reprogram a television station's late night schedule. Finish up, honey, and get to sleep. And happy birthday. Security, uh, Norm. Norm is speaking. Uh, uh, afternoon, everyone! Anytime. Norman, this is Mr. Eddie Vedder from accounting. Did he just say Eddie Vedder? Could you uh, read me the number on the modem? Um, it's a little boxy thing, Norm, with switches on it. Let's my computer talk to the one there. 212-555-4240. And that's why they hired him. Attention to detail. Despite Paul Blart here reading the wrong numbers, Dade gets in. Unfortunately, without his cool shades. Momentarily, anyway. Yak, yak, yak. Get a job. And I am. It seems like another hacker going by acid burn is already nested there and has been monitoring the intrusion. What? Wait, was Acid Burn watching Alex Jones light here before Dade shut it off? The fight quickly devolves into a Bible school altercation while Optimus Prime's leaked sex tape plays alongside cringy text one-liners designed in Flash. And yes, I understand it was Future Splash Animator then. Don't at me trying to debunk a joke, nerds. Come on, this is the internet. Are you telling me that nobody's admitted to fucking the other's mom or devolved into calling each other gay lords? Talk about unrealistic. War never changes. Shit on me. Early the next morning, Dade rushes to grab a quick bite to eat and a shower before the first day of school while his mom, played by Alberta Watson, berates him over the amount of time he's spent on his computer the past week with a bit of physical comedy. Can I cut the electricity to his room so he'll sleep normal hours? He's been playing with his computer all night for a solid week. Well, yes, he could be playing with himself. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll ask Dade. You like girls, don't you? What is this? Plumbers don't wear ties. Just pretend like I have it in my hands. Just pretend. It's like 400 bucks. Do you see ads on this channel? You haven't been doing anything stupid, right, Dade? Right, Dade? Right, Mom. And I'm still a virgin. Ah, the 90s, when spending too much time on the computer equated to concerning questions about your sexuality with people that call themselves family. You hooked it up to the phone, didn't you? Yay! Actually, no. Somehow he did all that wirelessly two years before Wi-Fi was even invented. Weird. Let me just find it here real quick. Ah. You are forbidden to own or operate a computer or touch-tone telephone until the day of your 18th birthday. And now for the scene from last night. Finish up, honey, and get to sleep. And happy birthday. Back. And to the left. Until the day of your 18th birthday. Back. And to the left. And happy birthday. Back. 18th. And to the left. Birthday. Back. We get it. Good. Because they sure didn't and they wrote the fucking thing. You're going to love New York. It's a city that never sleeps. We get another establishing shot to prove that, yes, New York does in fact still exist. Well, most of it anyway. I meant the Pan Am sign. What the fuck, editor? Then there's this weird transition with neon lights for some company called Samsung. And, of course, Runway 69. Now at school, one that looks like a repurposed train station, instead of asking one of the hundreds of kids that are just mulling around the halls, Dade decides to interrupt the only one person that looks legitimately busy and may have a supporting role. Played by Rinaldi Santiago, aka Freak. Hey, kink shaming is not okay. What? That's his handle. 
Oh, what are you looking at his handle for? His screen name, dude. Excuse me. Yo, chill, man. I'm talking to Venezuela. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just looking for the principal's office. Sorry, I can't help you, kid. Since Freak was no help in simply pointing Dade in a direction, he ends up in homeroom looking like a bored toddler at Chuck E. Cheese. Or this is some holding lot for movie love interests, where our second lead, Kate, played by Angelina Jolie in her first ever feature length appearance, randomly pops up to guide Dade to his first class. Do you speak English? Sorry. You wanted... I wanted transfer forms. Kate takes him around and points out a few of the amenities before dropping him off at his first period like daycare for the sexually frustrated. But before heading to her own class, she's goaded into giving him a bit of first day insider trading knowledge about the crown jewel of this building, an Olympic sized swimming pool on the roof. Take the stairs over there. Yeah, sure. Oh sweet, a pool. <laughs> Dude, a pool in the 90s was like three Ferraris parked next to each other. Are they your Ferraris? No. Okay. A pool in the 90s was like a grilled cheese sandwich with a whole pickle right out of the jar. Like, for free, or... What? I don't get it! So Dave decides that a swim is better than being on time for his first day of class and blindly leaps out where a herd of traditionally tricked nerd are desperately trying to flag someone down for help off the roof. There's going to be a naturally formed D&D group up there by lunch. Here's where... Oh, I get it now. No, you don't. Is it a dill? You're a dill. You're the dill. Oh. oh my god, you found the pool. Here's where Kate and Dade's nerdy mating ritual, the secondary plot of the movie, is set up. Freak, bored of watching a gif, gif, I oh, bless you, of boning skeletons, noticing that Dade has some obvious skills at getting into secured systems and is currently changing information to make it appear he's been enrolled in Kate's class. So introductions are in or- Fencing. The school has fencing. Designing graphical interface. So, uh, what's your interest in Kate Libby, eh? Academic, purely sexual. Homicidal. Before Freak can pass the wire, Joey, the community noob, played by Jesse Bradford, comes barreling down the steps asking for Freak's help in obtaining a cool sounding handle. I don't have an identity until I have a handle. You know you're right about that. A screen name. Yeah, I got it. Check it, Friday. Meanwhile, at Club Somebody's house, Dade finally shows up as Shaggy dropped off hard, aka Matthew Lillard, is outside selling mixtapes. Uh, you can't make that joke. He wasn't officially Shaggy until 2002. He was always Shaggy. You're just a linearist. I don't know how to respond to that. Well, that's because I didn't write one for you. Please deposit five dollars for the first minute. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. Ask anybody that was around when payphones existed. They tried to get the clearest recording they could from this until they learned what red boxes were and how stupid they felt after. I wonder if this still works. Hello, Jason. Throughout your life, you've treated others like minor characters in a story written all about you. Pushed away those that loved and cared for you into the background. Where'd we get this recorder? <laughs> Things have happened. Hello. Wait a minute. When Dade asked Freak for directions to the office at school, he acted like his call to Venezuela was so costly that he couldn't take a moment to point out the way. So all he was doing was sitting on a free phone call and being a worthless asshole. Window! Pass him a quiet. What the fuck? God, I wish I had real friends. How is this possible? It's a script. That's how it works.
That's not what I mean. And other Jason? That's not even a real name. That's a fucking placeholder between bong rips. You think that's trippy? Next time say something while looking at the page we're on. At the deep end of the Foot Clan's hideout, we find Kate dressed like a vacuum-sealed marshmallow man, playing an unreleased prototype of Wipeout as Dave moves in for the challenge. That's a nice score for a girl. Think you can do better? I'll give it a shot. Channeling all his inner butt hurt from earlier at school, Dade goes super sweaty, try hard, super sweat, and one shots her high score. Even manages to psychically type in his name. Hey, Psygnosis, what happened to that feature? Well, it looks like I'm on top. Game over, yeah! People always seem to have an issue with this scene. Damn psychics. What? No. They beating Kate on his first try. If she's so good, and he's never played the game before, how did he get to be on top? Because he's psychic? I mean, well, maybe, but the thing I'm more curious about is, how does only playing the first level nab you the high score? He probably asked future Joey and future Freak sitting on the balcony for tips. Afterwards, back outside... Oh man, this jet lag... I think I'm gonna have this thing. <coughs> We're provided some nice ASMR of a loose butthole sitting on a pile of grapes with Kate and her boyfriend loudly making out on the back of his bike as Dade and crew walk up twice before everyone heads home for the night. But someone isn't done being a vindictive little shit. In the wee hours of the morning, Dade's busy preparing a little something for later at school. Just before vengeance o'clock rolls around, Dade stands in the hallway, waiting on Freak that apparently slept in his clothes from yesterday, or somebody accidentally switched some of the scenes around. There goes the computer lab and home egg and the library. <laughs> oh yeah, my bad. It's a little worn from the laser with all the replays this scene got. There we go. What the hell is going on? Who on the roof must have a leak? Oh man, this is gonna be good. Later, I guess after mopping up the thousands of gallons of water on everything in last period advanced English, a few familiar looking students are writing quotes from their favorite authors on the board. Meanwhile, Dade, somehow able to remain hidden throughout the entirety of the class, has his invisible cloak pulled by the teacher's curiosity on his chosen quote, an early passage from Allen Ginsberg's Howl, part one. Nice, very nice. Okay. He's not enrolled in this class. Well, he's on my list. I think Kate's talking about the other white mark, because that magically vanished. Of all the things I've lost, I miss my mind the most. <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne. Woo, Sharon! You. What is your name? Uh, Manuel Goldstein, sir. Subtle. After school, in a scene that doesn't really need to exist, Dade continues to bitch about living in New York some more as his mom tries to get him to fill out resumes for a future in the company she works at. Although it's never really brought up again or makes any difference in the story, so it doesn't really matter. Skip to later that day at Club Next Door, the crew's sitting around passively listening to Joey's latest attempt to be elite, when another member shows up to crash. The party. Man, you're good at this. Captain Crunch here is basically the proxy for 2600 Magazine's founder, Eric Corley, ranting about how Orwell's novelized warnings are alive and well in this era of three-letter authoritarianism. Meet serial killer. Eyes and fruit loops. But he does know things. Anyway, anyway, guys, guys, listen, listen. I'm in this computer, right? So I'm looking around. You got know. those Crayola books? Oh, yeah. Technicolor rainbow. Yeah. Green one. What is that? What is that? What is that? Let me see. What are these? 
international Unix environments. Luscious orange. Computer security criteria, DOD standards. The pink shirt book, guide to IBM PCs, so-called due to the nasty pink shirt that I wear on the cover. What's that? Devil book, Unix Bible. What's that? Dragon book, compiler of design. Yeah? What's that? The red book, NSA trusted networks. Otherwise known as the ugly red book that won't fit on a shelf. Someone did their research. Wait a minute. I've been very naughty. Wait, didn't you ask the director, Ian Softley, and Eric Corley about a year and a half ago if this was true and they never responded? Uh, look out, neckbeards! Oh. oh my god, Joseph, how could you? I'll handle them. You handle us. You'll handle us. You know, your predecessors have much more respect. No, you. Oh man, let's see the strings. Okay, you have some skill. You guys always think I should know everything, you never tell me anything. All right, right, right? All right, what are the huh? three most common used passwords? Love, secret, and uh, sex. But not in that order, necessarily, right? Yeah, but don't forget God. System operators love to use God. It's that whole male ego thing. Those weren't ever the top used passwords. You want to know what the top used passwords were and have always been since the internet was invented? Screen name, real name, pet name, favorite thing, and this. So the combination is one, two, three, four, five. That's the stupidest combination I ever heard in my life. That's the kind of thing an idiot would have on his luggage. Thank you, your highness. What did you do? I turned off the wall. Why didn't you turn off the whole movie? I must have pressed the wrong button. Well, put it back on. Put the yes, movie sir. back yes, on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't forget passwords. Stupid assholes love to use password. It's that whole stupid asshole thing. Nice. Shut the fuck up. And changed. To what? All of them. In what order? want a seriously righteous hack you score one of those gibsons man you know supercomputers they used to like do physics and look for oil and stuff ain't no way man security's too tight the big iron boy are you gonna be surprised how tight it can get in a few years maybe but if i were gonna hack some heavy metal i'd uh work my way back through some low security and try the back door yeah but oh man wouldn't you just love get one of those gibsons baby mm. okay one don't do that. I'm cursed now. And two, Gibson? Is this why we're doing this movie? A reference to the Johnny Mnemonic review? No. Well, not initially. So Joey takes the information he just learned to heart. Because it certainly didn't go through his fucking head first. And decides to try his luck against the Gibson supercomputer at Ellingson Mineral, a global oil conglomerate. There's a curb ahead. I'm gonna speed it up. Now this is how to create a user interface. None of that simplistic, easy to use, responsive stuff. I want scrolling through directories to feel like being reborn as a bird mid-flight, about to slam into a freshly cleaned window of a high-rise. <laughs> you and me, Lucy. We're gonna show them, baby. Either a Terminator is about to spawn, or they have a serious grounding issue in their servers. Either way, Joey's unwanted sexual advances towards his computer Lucy have apparently triggered Hal, played by Penn Gillette, the hapless techno weenie security guard for Ellingson Mineral that watches over the logins of their Gibson supercomputer and reports to Eugene Belford, the head of cybersecurity. Certainly not the head of housekeeping. My name is the plague. No 9,000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. Uh, Mr. The Plague, uh, something, something weird's happened on the net. Uh, the accounting subdirector in the Gibson's working really hard. We got one person online and the workload is enough for like 10 users. 
I think we got a hacker. If a hen pecking the keyboard is seen as 10 users worth of data usage, they're paying Ellingson employees to throw around stress balls at each other all day because this would get you fired from anywhere else. Oh. Yo, baby, what's your AS? What the hell? Quit throwing shit, man. I'm trying to get laid. Oh, my bad. Did I ruin your chances? Wasn't my type. Here's another scene that people bitch about when watching this movie, and in actuality is one of the more realistic situations to me. Why does Joey choose to copy a garbage file instead of look for something important? A garbage file just has garbage in it. Aside from the fact that he's just there to get proof that he can do it. Ever hear the saying, one person's trash is another's treasure? Quick experiment. If you haven't cleared your recycling bin, open it up. See what's inside. What do those files say about you personally? What information can be obtained from them? I have a really obscene image of that shower dinosaur from the Flintstones and a notepad entry with a bunch of commas and shit written into a hand flipping me off. That means you probably shouldn't use my email as a password recovery alternative next time. Joey discovers something amazing inside the garbage file and stares in awe at its intricate beauty. Whoa! <laughs> Is it the equation to the meaning of life? Bush's baked bean secret family recipe? Hell, it could be some sort of sentient electronic hentai tentacle monster for all we know, because I've never seen data act like that before. But whatever it is, Joey feels the need to try and save it to a single 3.5 inch, 1.44 megabyte capacity floppy. Those things could store the universe back then. So we get our first look at our main antagonist, entering via Star Trek Bridge Portal, played by Fisher Stevens, dressed like a pimp from Utah riding a skateboard, about to track down a hacker on the world's most impractical and uncomfortable keyboard ever made. Well, one thing they definitely got close was the ungodly amount of time it takes to download something on a dial-up modem. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. He's gone. Joey's mom turns off Lucy, effectively ruining the download, severing the trace, and the psychedelic screensaver lived happily ever after in the garbage, and nobody was the wiser. The end. So, see you next time when I review Waterworld. What? Don't forget to comment, rate, and subscribe. They haven't had the rating system for years. Okay, fine. They did, in fact, complete the trace. The download that only went to 53% was somehow able to write on the disc. Joey managed to change clothes between shots, and the story behind the screensaver is currently to be continued. Later on that day, the group goes to meet up with their final member of the crew. To me. That was two Spaceball references. I'm on a roll. Or Lord Nikon, as he's known in a circle, played by Lawrence Mason, a hacker with the ability to recall any piece of information perfectly due to having photographic memory. Come on! Are we supposed to know that at this point? Look, if they can spoil future events, I can too. Maybe he should have used that superpower to recall his buddy Joey's face passing in the background of the show they're watching, currently being arrested behind Special Agent Gill of the Secret Service, played by Wendell Pierce. Could have warned him since this TV is in fact showing a glimpse of the future as this scene hasn't happened yet. But screw that, we have Sesame Street for system operators coming with Razor and Blade, played by Peter Kim and Darren Lee, or as I like to refer to them as, Woke the Crow and Freaky Keisha from Don't Be a Menace. Welcome to our show! Hack the planet! Hack the planet! The following morning, Joey's taking a shower, getting ready for school, when he's suddenly arrested and dragged butt naked from the bathroom, sat on the couch, and made to watch all of his equipment taken into custody. Downstairs, Special Agent Gill shows up to take over Agent Michael Gaston and Agent Mark Anthony's bust. Yeah, I know they're Agent Ray and Agent Bob, but they're never addressed that way, and I rather not.
Joey ends up getting paraded in front of the camera with his mom Janine Melnitz from Ghostbusters, and the scene from the Future Box plays out again. Ravage delicate private and publicly owned computer systems, infecting them with viruses and stealing sensitive materials. Meanwhile, at Don't Be Evil, Evil Corporation. That reminds me, I need more Freon for the AC. Eugene is holding a meeting with Mr. Laherty and Dean to discuss the intrusion due to Margot's weak choice in passwords and the subsequent pizza virus that was implanted into their system, currently holding an entire fleet of their oil tankers hostage unless certain demands are met. A virus planted within the Gibson computer system claimed responsibility. What, it left a note? That is the virus. Leonardo da Vinci. I don't remember Joey ever doing anything like that. Wait, did you just say pizza virus? Maybe evil Miss Bellum, played by Lorraine Bracco, and Lord Farquaad here will let us in on their little Team Rocket scheme of the week. What the hell was that all about? I had to move fast. The hacker copied my garbage file. What? Get it. Why did I ever trust you? Get the file, otherwise you'll lose all your toys. Nothing like stealing your evil plot from Superman 3. Meanwhile, at a very uncomfortably long establishing shot. Did you find the program for the virus on any of the disks we confiscated? No. He's either very smart or very stupid. Oh, so no WMDs in there either? This review is getting too political. Skip. What is this, 2018? Wait, what is that? What happens now? I don't know. Whoa, hey, what the hell? You staring off all weird like that. I thought you were about to start selling stamps or underwear or something. Unit 3 outside suspect Joey Pardilla's apartment. Nothing to report. Suspect still grounded by his mother. Listen to this bullshit. This is our world now. The world of the electron and the switch. The beauty of the bond. To cut off Mr. Markle here for copyright reasons, what he's reading is taken from a real and still very poignant piece of writing called The Conscience of a Hacker by The Mentor, also known as Lloyd Blankenship. It speaks a lot of truth for how short it is, and I suggest finding and reading it in its entirety if you're curious. Mark thought it was cool. Oh, that's cool. Cool? Yeah, cool. You think it's cool? It's cool. It's not cool. It's commie bullshit. Jesus! Later, at Prison Rape High, someone's Hot Pocket is in danger of getting penciled, while the rest of the crew steps into the dump a little exposition about Joey's bust as they practice their hygiene and invite Day to a party at Kate's house after school. Thought so. Oh, yeah. Little pelvis. Little pelvis and booty. Ah! Why is everybody suddenly screaming? We get Eugene playing what looks like the first VR headset to ever grace a shopping mall sharper image. You know, those things that people used to, you know, forget it, I'm old. As Agent Gill just walks right into Eugene's house, totally unannounced, and interrupts his game of Amber Heard Super Punch-Out to show him the stack of tattooed forest, turning our main protagonist into the main suspect of this faux investigation. Ugh. Hard copy. Dade Murphy. Later on, agents politely escort Dade into his house where Gil and Eugene are waiting to ask for his help. God. You sit in the bed and keep your hands where we can see him. We've come to believe that one Joey Pardell is involved in this Ellingson virus. He, or perhaps his accomplice, has a disc that Mr. Belford needs to disable that virus. We want you to help us find it. Nah. I don't play well with others. As quick as you could say, hey, this is illegal, I know my rights, get that nightstick out of my ass. They're gone, leaving Date alone, frightened, deeply pondering the trouble he's gotten himself into. There's the other burn mark. 
Or he has a wet dream of bondage in Kate's teenage titties. And I need to replace this damn DVD. Even later that day, the party started at Kate's house and the rest of the crew are showing up to badly ADR their lines. You know what I love about ADR? Why do now when you could do later? Am I right or am I right? Woo! Party! Excuse me, ladies. Yo, let me hit that. Damn, that's some good shit. We're gonna score a sack. Is this Indica or Sativa? <coughs> what the fuck? But on the other side of town, things aren't so fly. Was fly still a thing? I feel like fly was still a thing. Hi, my name is Vicky, and I'm an addict. Outside of being grounded during the day, apparently Joey didn't fully escape punishment for being a minor, as he has to spend his evenings in some 12-step program trying to convince the drunks and workaholic businessmen with piss-stained pants that he's not an addict. That sucks. Anyway, screw Joey, back to the fun! The crews made their own little party in Kate's bedroom as they nerd out over her laptop they found completely unlocked. Check this out, guys. This is insanely great. It's got a 28.8 BPS modem. Yeah? Matt, what's the matter? It's my parents. They still have a 28.8 modem. Hey, we were all 28.8 users once. The Geek Squad here pause at Kate's personal stuff like it's the cool thing to do, turning off the lights to stare in awe at the badly aimed projector bleeding polarized dog shit onto their faces in the back of the laptop lid. Come on guys, how do you miss that? Kate and Plus One hit the sheets next to the crew for another topless Jolie scene. While Kate's grinding away on Lames Dean here, everyone's busy creeping on them from the overly lit dark corner of the room. Hey, how come this scene isn't all worn out like the rest? Because YouTube can't 18 plus me for silhouettes, even though this is a fucking PG-13 film. Oh. Yeah, rules. Even going as far as that? noticing that she dyes her pubes somehow. Dot, 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 I think. Question mark. Why else would this line possibly be here? What does it mean? She's not wearing a bra. Burns wet wear matches her soft wear. Burn. And that's when Dade decides to become a cock block. Burn. Your acid burn. You booted me out of OTV? What? I'm crash override. You're the moron that's been invading my turf? <laughs> Your ass birds, I'm rash overheard. You made me look like a little bitch in front of my computer. It's actually short for burning herpes. Wanna make out with three guys bots? Okay. Oh yeah. Gross, dude. Meanwhile, Eugene's back at his place, busy sexualizing mugshots with a Texas twang, having just broken into the FBI's database and gloating to his girlfriend about wrecking someone's life by sending their mom to jail. See, kids? Swatting gets you what you want. Content is legal, medical, or financial advice. Author is not an attorney, nor plays one on TV. Legal birth is not included. No purchase necessary when. Open to legal U.S. residents 18 or older in the, in the 48 county U.S. Legal participation may affect actual cost. Rebates must be postmarked by 1231.4. Any reproduction or rebroadcast without the express written consent of immediately baseball is prohibited. Any resemblance to any person living or deceased is coincidental. Actual retail price may vary. Fresh from taking his shit and not washing his hands, Dade wants another crack at that computussy. So he sneaks back into the now completely different looking and well lit room while Kate stands around in her backyard checking out the skyline all deep and brooding when she hears her laptop scream for help. She goes to investigate, catching Dade pulling up a bunch of windows of silly shit, which I guess means this laptop is good since it didn't just burst into flames or something. I hope you don't screw like you type. Yes. I hope you don't suck like you sink. Has a killer refresh rate. P6 chip. Triple the speed of the Pentium. Well, double anyway. Crash override. What was it? Mess with the best, die like the rest. Yeah. <laughs> All of this back and forward has caused Kate and Dade's hate boners to touch and forge together, Challenge. challenging each other to a hack off. That means absolutely nothing to the story, other than to just get the two warring sides together in the end for the final confrontation against the big bad. Ah, spoilers, bro. Shut up. Oh, you want to have some sort of rom-com hack-off where we touch tips and make out underwater dressed as emo Barbie, huh? Hey, you're not supposed to have seen the movie before. I haven't. Why? Why? 
The two get ready for battle as the crew drops the rules through shitty narration where half the cast sounds like they're trying to sell you a timeshare while their boss is standing right behind them. One plot halting montage later and we finally get to see their vengeance exacted as Agent Gill is slightly inconvenienced by being unable to pay for his dinner date. I can't tell if their little attack actually worked, or if their waiter is so goddamn stupid he didn't even scan the card the right way before deciding to destroy it. I do, however, like how layered the scene is, as in the background you could see Agent Gill's car about to be towed. Then comes what I consider a step backwards, if you can believe it, the tried and true put him in the personals tactic. Not really sure how this is a hack, as it's more like ordering a bunch of pizzas and having them delivered to somebody's house. Although in this case, instead of pizza, it's dick. I, I know where you can stick it. I, I know where you can stick it. I just oh. want to lick your earlobes. I want to lick your lips. Oh, I'm gonna lick your toes. oh yeah, you're going to lick? And then I'm gonna you want to lick something? Lick ankles. this. The gloves are off as the crew has made their way to the top of the Empire State Building for some reason so Kate can change Agent Gill's arrest record to have 113 moving violations. Which seems like a little much to me. I figured hitting triple digit traffic stops, someone would have taken your license away by now. Hey, ah, hey, hey, hey. Or getting handcuffed and grinded into the hood of your car. Are we sure this is for the traffic violations and not a late answer to that personal ad? Either way, the coup d'etat comes later in the form of Dade cracking the Treasury Department's employee records to change Gill's status to deceased. I'm what? Winning him the tying point and setting him into overtime, where the stakes have risen. Due to Mr. Gill's untimely demise and all, guess you two will have to improvise the next round. Right. I win. You wear a dress on our date. <laughs> and if I win, so do you. Because there's nothing like saying, I love who you are, like making someone change to embarrass them, or fit your wants. True love. That soft skin, those supple thighs, such sexy childbearing hips, that tight. Five o'clock shadow! <laughs> the next day at school, Dade's walking the halls when he meets up with Kate, adding a little Dave. tension to the bet. I, don't I, uh, I didn't know your size, so um, I guessed. Oh, suddenly it's okay to kink shame? Just don't. Aw, oh, how cute. Eugene sent a dick pic full of web dings along with some fancy sounding pillow talk about being one of the two things in Texas when it comes to hacking and he forgot his horns or some silly shit. And by the way, this is the most unrealistic part of the movie. We all know how UPS works. Mail's here. What? It's a package from the plague. No, that's just my laptop from earlier, only in a box, now broken. And it's a message from the plague. Just watch. We are the keyboard and all those other. What are we going to do with a laminator? While Eugene is trying to intimidate Dade into getting the disc back for him, Janine springs Slimer for good behavior. Bet that's got to make Dade feel good after his family was fined thousands of dollars and torn apart because he crashed a few computers when he was a little kid, while Joey, nearly an adult, gets grounded for an afternoon and has to go cry about his issues in some room full of quitters for installing ransomware and threatening a potential natural disaster of global proportions. Joey decides to take the disc and seek help from Freak, choosing the most public place on the fucking planet to wave around the evidence he was just charged for. I copied a garbage file. Big deal, the garbage file's got shit in it, Joey. No, no, I, it, it's like hot or something, I don't know. Oh shit, Joey, you got a tail. Oh, so the plan of meeting at Times Square during rush hour didn't pan out, huh? Weird. Regardless of how moronic that idea was, they managed to escape the two Keystone cops and hide the evidence in school before going home and getting rid of anything that can incriminate them in the process.
watching you. For a moment, I thought the authorities in this universe were actually competent at their job. Wake up. Amanu. Time for school. Come on. Deja vu. Switch. APOC. Ray Sanchez, you're under arrest under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986. You think those fully armed police want to get in the middle of that? If she went for a sandal, everybody in that room would be two days from retirement. Freak is booked and run through scared straight at the county jail to get his one phone call, which he uses to exposition dump a warning to the others. You know, like a fucking friend would, Joey. Hey, it's me. Freak? I'm freaking. Kate decides to tempt fate and enter Roosevelt's hideout dressed like half a Power Ranger and retrieves the disc, taking it to Dade in hopes he can help despite the rivalry. It's nice room. We need your help. Do my ears deceive me? No, 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 no. Truce, you guys. Listen, we got a higher purpose here, right? A wake-up call from the Nintendo generation. We demand free access to data. Well, it comes with some responsibility. When I was a child, spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. What the fuck did you just say? You see, this is what I mean. I honestly think Matthew Lillard just wandered on set one day and they were too weirded out to tell him to leave, so they gave him a beeper and some rollerblades and let him loose in front of the camera. Every single scene with this guy so far can be cut out and not a bit of the story would be lost. Hell, it wouldn't even change the flow of dialogue. Don't believe me? Watch. Let's play editor for a bit. Remember when we first met him outside the door at the arcade selling vomit death mixtapes? Cut! Oh look, we just simply go into the building after the establishing shot, like a normal movie now. What about the next day at school with the chalkboard? Aussie reference gone. When he came in bumming food and showed us that Dade once read a book before? Cut! What changed? Nothing! Joey just gets to his stupid ass story faster. Dude asking to sleep over at Lord Nikon's? Cut! Telling Dade about the party at Kate's? Cut! At the party? Cut! And so on! Anyway, Dade bitches out on helping his friends because, for whatever reason, he doesn't want to simply tell them he's zero cool. How does that help this situation? It doesn't! It's just some stupid way to make a name bullshit seem way more important than it is. Want to know a secret? He tells them later and hears their response. No, that's great. There goes MIT. I'll make it up! They telling them that changes nothing! But hey, nice reference, I think. Whatever. You know, even my compliments are starting to sound insulting. Dade does manage to get his useless ass up and at least promise to copy that floppy. Turn on your laptop. Set it to receive a file. Lauren Murphy is now a wanted felon in the state of Washington. Again, how it would have really gone. Is it done yet? No. What about now? Almost. Good, good. A few moments later. So, what about- Wait. How are we talking on the phone and online at the same time? Hello? Eugene rattles on with his little keyboard warrior tirade about how he'll go after the people Dade loves unless Dade helps him get the disc back. And all I keep thinking is, once he changes all the information in the computer, how's he going to change the... Ugh. Hard copy. Regardless of how stupid this plan is, it just... It works out just fine, as Dade is a complete dumbass and decides to sneak out and purposely hand Eugene incriminating evidence. Talk to me. I got it. Your mommy's safe now, okay? So where can I come by and pick- Eh, uh, he'll figure it out.
I just can't with you right now, movie. I, why? Why? I mean, 90s, but why? Of all the silly ass shit to do, no wonder Dade stood around for hours. You have your antagonist sketching his own limo just so he could try to look cool skating by and snatching the disc. So is it cool or not? Hell yeah it is! I'm gonna do this as soon as I get home from school. Is legal medical financial advice. Is not an plays one on TV. Boy, brave, not no purchase necessary win. Open US residence, 18 or older. In the, in the Eugene disappears into the smoke like Goodwill Batman. Well, actually, he shit turning the corner. But we cut across town where Dade rejoins the crew in the middle of trying to dissect half the missing data from the original disc. <coughs> Wait a minute. Hold up. If they gave Dade the original disc and he just got to the apartment, how are they looking at the source co You know what? It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. Magic hackers, magic reviewers, look at it, I'm doing the same exact thing. I got the DVD in my hand and we're currently watching it on TV. You know what, just start the fucking montage. The day is approaching to give it your best and you've got to reach your prime. That's when you need to put yourself to the test and show us a passage of time. We're gonna need a montage. It isn't a virus, it's a worm. I know, I know who wrote it. What? This Ellingson security creep. I gave him a copy of the disc you gave me. What? You what? Didn't know what was on it. Why did he come to you? I got a record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Skip to second act. Close. Cool. I'll hack the Gibson. Woohoo! <laughs> The crew prepares for battle, breaking into the back area of Ellingson Mineral, where Dade and Cater tasked to find useful information on unshredded documents that are just lying around in the open dumpster. You know, if I didn't live by a strict code of honor, I might take advantage of this situation. Erotically, as it were. <laughs> And we'll just add attempted murder to your charges. The rest of the crew is busy snagging telecom equipment for phone bugs and infiltrating the offices in disguise as repairmen and delivery workers to memorize logins of careless low-level office personnel. Fuck, that's a long-ass line. Meanwhile, Eugene and Margot are discussing just how screwed they'd be if the information on the disc is recovered by the feds, so they decide to launch the virus at the end of the worm's run and flee under the cover of its chaos before everything is found out. So why don't they just leave right now? Excuse me? Why don't they just leave right now, like on vacation? They could say it's their anniversary. They already have 21 million because, because movie. movie. Yeah, right. Yeah. In light of this new attack and pressure from Ellingson Mineral, the feds are now issuing warrants on all known associates within the group. See rant here. Uh, what now? That scene's not in the review anymore. Then why do I say that? I don't know. The writer thought it was funny to leave it in. I'm the writer. Are you? Am I? Don't you start with me. Lucky for them and their extraordinary timing on bugging Ellingson's phones, the crew has now overheard their plans to arrest them tomorrow at 9, so they decide to meet up on Pelham 123, an exposition dump. Exposition dump a while. Check this out. Hey, what's with the Vinci virus? What? It's a memo about how they're going to deal with those oil spills that happened on the 14th. What oil spills? Whoa, whoa. No brain dead. Today's the 13th. Well, this hasn't happened yet. I know it may sound like the stupidest thing possible to create documents with a post date prior to the knowledge of an attack. Wait a minute, the 14th, that's the same day the worm ends its run. But? Da Vinci virus didn't, Where? Didn't freak no, it sounded like there was going to be some sort of opposing conclusion to that statement. Did it? That's funny. Instead, Kate gets the idea to enlist the help of Thing 1 and Thing 2, currently getting drunk off monk piss at a renovated Hot Topic while Proto Rage plays. Oh, I've played this game before. Quick, we have to change the channel. There's about to be a bunch of guys attacking a girl in the shower with a drill. So Kane's dick from RoboCop 2 holds Dade up at gunpoint. Well, <laughs> 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 mm. 
So, Kane's dick from RoboCop 2 holds Data up at gunpoint while Kate flops her girl nuts down and challenges Razor and Blade via CCTV to help in hopes they accept. She's buff. Ballsy. Let's keep her. Waste the dude. We're very busy. A TV network that wishes to remain nameless has expressed an interest in our show. Let's go, Kate. Wait. Nobody said no. I wish I could guilt trip a random celebrity into doing something. Right, random celebrity cameo? Why is everything laminated? The next morning, or later, whatever, Dade's setting up a trap for the feds about to spring on the crew hanging out at Bryant Park, de-sixing Rabbi Tuckman's H2, when Serial gets a page on his block of shaved soap. It's Kate, Grand Central. Let's hit it! Well, at least the time is correct. Man, that was disgusting. Whoa, windshield wiper went right through his head. <laughs> French berry? Fuck. Eventually, the crew makes it to Grand Central Station on the slowest day this place has ever experienced, and they find a row of payphones that don't have a line of 40 people waiting for them or bum shit smeared on them as they meet up with Joey for the final confrontation with the big bad. <laughs> Alright, listen up. Use your best viruses to buy us some time. We have to get into Plague's file and copy the worm. <laughs> alright, there's a little tension breaker that had to be done, alright? You were dropped, weren't you? I'm not talking as a baby. I mean recently. What the hell is that, an R-Zone? Actually, it's a Hitachi Zubernaut fucking Pompa Blair Black K. After that little outburst from Serial, Kate decides to substitute Joey in, again showing that Serial Killer was never a real character to begin with and was simply dropped in at the last minute. I don't know, looked cool. You couldn't even do a new take for that, you had to grab a clip from Johnny Mnemonic. You know, I can't even tell you to blow me because I'm afraid some time cop situation will happen and I'll have to live with your head melted to my crotch. So Joey pinch hits for Serial and everybody boots up with their own little nifty intros. Everyone starts infecting Elliotson's computers with everything they've got as Dade makes his way into the Gibson for the garbage file. There's a new virus in the database. What's happening? It's replicating, eating up memory. Uh, what do I do? Type cookie, you idiot. Again, nice reference. Wikipedia? You're using Wikipedia as your source of information. Um, I'll head him off at the pass. We have a zero bug attacking all login and overlay files. Die, dickweeds. Turns out the Gibson may be too quick for the crew and is easily taking out their ranks, stalling them long enough for the virus to be unleashed and start flooding the tankers. garbage files i need more time maybe you should i don't know ask the dude that's been there and is currently standing three phone booths away from your location no nah, of course not joey doesn't remember what are you watching what movie are you watching idiot to top it off eugene traces them to the train station and alerts the feds still pissing around in the intersection he's even he even has time to ring up dade for a little villain gloat game's over Last chance to get out of this without a prison sentence. You're not good enough to beat me. Oh, shit. Yeah, maybe I'm not. We are, you asshole. 
Give it up. Just give it up. Razor and Blade finally arrive with their group of international shit shows, sending Dade and friends spinning around in a booth like some early 90s game show bonus round, as yet another Tron light cycle battle happens at the sound of guitars made out of cats and heat. Wails in the background. The fuck am I writing? They're going for the Colonel. Colonel who? <gasps> I knew it! The 11 secret herbs and spices! The Secret Service finally arrives on site, what took four people rollerblading a couple of minutes. So, yeah, your normal response time. This is the end, my friend. Thank you for calling. Oh, shit! Got me. Eugene nukes Dade's connection just as the feds make their way down to the lower levels of the train station. They have one chance left. Joey, of all people, is still inside the Gibson. I think you might want to disconnect those. You know, hackers, environmental disaster, so on. Nope. Jesus, I didn't know payphones had fiber speed connection. Kill the Gibson. Roger that. Are you nuts? Come at me! They're in the colonel. That must be a bit confusing for everybody in the room. The hackers shit all over the Gibson, but the virus is destroyed and the tankers still manage to stay afloat? Enjoy pointing out the faults of others. Yeah, a little. Agent Gill and the Babysitters Club finally get their saggy asses over fast enough to catch the group before they applied for passports and waited the average six to nine weeks to come in the mail. But of course, they aren't searched for weapons or evidence, so Dade manages to toss a copy of the worm in the trash as he's being escorted out and even warns Serial of where it is as he's being loaded in a police car. They're trashing our rights, man! They're, they're trashing the floor of data! They're trashing! Trashing! Serial, the dude that also currently has an arrest worn out. Hike the planet! Hike the planet! Shut up and get in the car! Hike the planet! Hike the planet! And now he's screaming. Well, he is wearing a hat. I'm not even going to go into this tool rooting around in the trash while a cop is literally standing right behind him as he pulls the damn disc out, but it seems to be all over for the rest of the crew, as Agent Gill informs Eugene that the group is in custody and will no longer be a threat. <laughs> My god, is this the first time somebody's actually gotten laid in this movie? Me, alright? I did it. She knows shit about computers. She's just my girlfriend. <laughs> I don't know what's going to get you in more trouble, sitting there lying to the Secret Service or calling her computer skills shit when she whooped your ass at the beginning of the movie. We've got a Mrs. Murphy to see you, sir. The news crew you requested is here. Oh, good, because I have a few things to tell them. Your son is facing 30 felony counts in an ongoing investigation. You face possible arrest if you do that. Mister, I don't care if I face certain death. This is why I believe we missed a whole bunch of character building with Dade's mom and that job application. We're like th three minutes out from final thought. I'm tired. My ass is numb. I think somebody stabbed okay, okay, their okay, dick okay, through wait, my wait, chest. Wait, 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 What? After Agent Gill gets shit in by Dade's mom, he decides giving an interview is a good idea. But nah. Here comes the one thing that serial killer actually does in this movie that's all his own and can't be deleted or explained away. So I'm just going to let this one live. The crew is proven innocent on all charges. I mean, serial killer hopped on TV and everyone is suddenly allowed out of the interrogation rooms with no resistance. I guess we're just supposed to forget about all the other felonies that they actually committed. The password for this hungry little sucker belongs to Margo, head of public oh relations God. for Ellingson Mineral, and Eugene Belford, computer security officer. Son of a oh my. bitch! Oh. Yo, kind of feel like God. You resurrected Skylab that crashed in 79 for this shot, you might just be. Plague? Eugene! 
Ninja, vanish! So Margot gets sent to the Snot Wallet Inn for her comeuppance. Well, I guess the feds just wanted to go on a mini vacation after all that. Because I highly doubt they'd wait long enough for the plane to be mid-flight so they can make an arrest on a cinematic gotcha moment of a 204-year-old man, even if he was the inventor of the finite state machine. Thank you. You're welcome. What's going on? Let go of me! Stewardess! I'll never fly this airline again! And look who's finally wearing a dress. Oh, God! So Dade performs one last felony to prove his love for Kate. Beat that. They drown each other in a ritual murder-suicide. Their bodies weren't found for days. The smell was atrocious. It was a closed casket funeral. Gross, dude. The end. And that was the 1995 box office bomb Hackers, starring Angelina Jolie, Johnny Lee Miller, and Fisher Stevens. Was it worth the- Are you fucking kidding me? A critic score of 31 on Rotten Tomat- No. Hell no. Sure, now it's a laughably outdated, culturally exaggerated, glam rock, cyberpunk light version of electronic espionage from the 90s. I mean, come on. Rollerblading. Rollerblading. Even the director of the film regretted adding that part. But come the fuck on, 31%? Look, I'm not crazy. Elder Jason looks extremely confused. My rose-tinted glasses for this movie have not gotten in the way of seeing the faults that deny it from ever reaching a fresh score in my eyes. Hell, unless you used the timecode skip in the description, you probably just sat through an hour and some odd minutes of me shoving that idea down your throats. And yeah, the audience score of 68% is just as fucking asinine on the opposite end of the scale, but since there's only 45 critic reviews, compared to more than 100,000 from the audience, and I'm far too lazy to read all that, guess who receives my wrath? Plus, they call themselves professionals. They have it coming. I definitely agree that this movie had a lot of issues with continuity, superfluous characters spouting stupid techno babble bullshit that was even outdated before the movie was released, and the story wasn't the strongest, to say the least, having a plot literally ripped from Superman 3. We all know how good that movie was. But as far as all that goes, the movie isn't as bad as this dismal score leads you to believe. Not even close. Judging by what a few of these critics consider an insult by comparing hackers to an elongated music video, that's just a blatant indication this movie was not for them. And actually a pretty good way to sum it up. It is flashy, it is over the top, and it does give off that more than it is vibe, especially when it was trying to appeal to the younger audience of the time, Generation X. Its tagline even says a wake-up call for the Nintendo generation. And as someone that was at the very tail end of that era, it sure was for me. This was never going to be a Citizen Kane, guys. It's a fucking movie about teenage hackers in the 90s. So if you're going to sit there docking at points for trying to make typing look cool, you're hating on it for one of the only things a movie about hacking should be trying to accomplish. Because believe it or not, hacking is basically all typing. If they didn't spice it up a little with crazy full motion interfaces, flights through rainbow colored circuit boards, and glass server towers arcing lightning bolts, and rollerblading, it would just be a bunch of sweaty neckbeards sitting around in a basement that probably smells like piss and vinegar, knee deep in empty junk food wrappers, and there would definitely be no Angelina Jolie titties, except maybe in poster form. So for those seeking something to watch that doesn't take itself too seriously, and a little romp into the nostalgic world of the internet and cheesiness of the digital 90s, give it a try. You're going to be pleasantly surprised at how much fun it actually is, despite it not being very accurate to the culture's majority. If I had to choose a number to rate this movie, I certainly wouldn't rate it as ridiculously low as 31%, or crazy high as 68%, but somewhere around the middle of the two in the range of 46 to 50. It still isn't fresh, but it's still really enjoyable and, at the very least, worth a watch. Speaking of, thanks for watching another one of my obnoxiously convoluted, barely researched, and grammatically atrocious reviews. Don't forget to comment, rate, and subscribe. Wait, we're not going to do a tie-in skit to the next review? I never really did one before, I just made fun of the Matrix. What do you mean, next review? What do you mean, you people? What? Forget it. I'm just tired. I haven't slept since that face thing from the Johnny Mnemonic review. Since 2019? Yeah, <laughs> so instead of sleeping, check this out. Wow, so we're just ripping off TV shows now, huh? As you can see, I've been doing some research. I believe I've... I believe I've figured out the pattern. 
I've linked every joke, every reference, every foreshadow, allegory, whatever, to a single key point. The reason for every single movie that we've had to review so far. Do you know what it is? It's Kevin Bacon, right? It's always Kevin Bacon. Look, I just choose these movies at random. Are you getting all weird because of that thing with the script from earlier? It didn't smell like ass at all. It's not Kevin Bacon. I don't think. Oh, I get it.